But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken, and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken, and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house been broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. So this is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is uh, traditionally one of those times back in the back in the early the Middle Ages and all of that. It was a it was a time similar to Lent, where you're doing a lot of repenting and you're doing a lot of soul searching and getting right with God in anticipation of Christmas, which was a a festival when we celebrate the birth of Christ and all of that means in the world. And Advent is always this, we kind of live in this tension of uh, two worlds that are represented during Advent. One is Advent as a time of looking back at the expectations that led up to the birth of Jesus Christ, the the longing for a Messiah and the, the outcry to God from God's people in their mourning and in their sorrow and the response of God through the birth of Jesus Christ. But Advent is also a time when, when people are looking forward to the, what, uh, what in Greek is called the parousia, the, the appearing of Jesus Christ as king, as conqueror, as Christus Victor, we are told. Um, and you need to, you need to know uh, going into this that every book in the New Testament was written from the perspective of people who thought Jesus was coming and coming very soon. They thought Jesus was going to return as a you know, more the conquering Messiah, not this touchy-feely, stand around singing kumbaya and holding hands kind of Messiah, but a Messiah with us in his hand. So they were really hoping for that. Uh, and the entire New Testament lives in expectation of Jesus's uh, second advent, second coming, the, the appearing or the parousia of Jesus Christ. From the earliest writings of Paul in the 50s uh, and well into the turn of the century, all of them, while they've had to adjust some of their expectations, it was, uh, it was getting clear toward the end of the century that it was going to be a little longer than they thought, <laughs> but they still were expecting uh, Jesus to come. And that's that is signaled and it's understood in a, a genre of writing that really only lasted about 200 years and that's in apocalyptic writing. The most familiar, of course, is Revelation is an apocalyptic writing. It's a writing style that masks a lot of language and, and kind of seems to predict uh, certain things coming to an end. And here in Matthew, we get a, a little snippet of kind of an apocalyptic view of things. Matthew, uh, Jesus in Matthew starts to paint a picture of what the, the, the end times might look like and what, uh, what people can expect when it comes to the second coming of the Son of Man. And in this case, for Matthew, he sees that as God coming in judgment. Now, for you and me, that sounds like bad news. Uh, probably our, you know, our good Christian guilt gets to us. We, we're like, we don't want to be judged. The Lord knows what all, you know, that's going to take a while. But, <laughs> but for Matthew's community and for most of the early Christian community who were under persecution, whether real or, or perceived, who felt under the thumb of persecution by Rome, by the, the Jewish establishment that they were 
breaking away from and by uh, just the culture in general as a sectarian group following this obscure carpenter. Uh, they felt persecuted and had been in truth persecuted uh, in Rome at least during Nero's reign. And so when you, uh, in the New Testament, when you hear the word judgment, what it sounds like to the original hearer is justice. God is going to come and make things right, is going to bring about justice, and will find that the people who have been persecuted, uh, they will find them righteous and find them in good standing. So, and there's kind of, there's two reactions in the world today about some of these, the, this apocalyptic writing and the idea of Jesus coming again and reigning as king and being this this kind of mighty warrior and things like that. Uh, some of us react to it and say, oh, you know, that's much ado about nothing. Um, the, you know, it's, it's grounded in its own time. It really doesn't, you know, they were, they were hoping for Jesus to come again because their life stunk so bad. <laughs> of course they're going to, of course they're going to long for Jesus to come and destroy the world because, uh, you know, the world wasn't doing them much good. Uh, so there's there's people like that who kind of think, eh, that, you know, that's not that's not really a realistic view of the world or how God works or the scriptures or anything like that. Others think uh, that it is at the very heart of what the gospel is about, and uh, they they hunt through the scriptures to see the prophecies of when Jesus is coming again. And then they look to the newspapers and they, lo and behold, they see all the things that Jesus was predicting, war and famine and earthquakes and, you know, darkness and, you know, the Russians and all kinds of stuff. Uh, the, all of a sudden it starts to come. And, and uh, I, some people uh, take this fear and they turn it into a lot of money, like Hal Lindsey. Uh, I was surprised to see how, if you don't know who Hal Lindsey is, he wrote The Late Great Planet Earth in the early 70s and uh, wrote out this thing about how the Bible was all about, the, you know, that the, we were living in the end times and Russia was going to be uh, the Antichrist and all of this, all this stuff that came out of that. And I was surprised to know that Hal Lindsey is still, like, has his own TV show and is writing books and making a bunch of money off this idea that that completely didn't happen in the 70s. So he must have revamped it somehow. I haven't stopped to pay any attention to it, but I, I'm just surprised he's still around. And of course, uh, folks like uh, LaHaye, who have made popular the Left Behind series, they have this apocalyptic view of the world that says, oh, the Bible is going to culminate in the end times. And of course, the end times are now. <laughs> and uh, this, this kind of thinking, it, it produces, there's a couple of things that come out of this, and this anticipation, this kind of obsession with uh, prophetic uh, coming of Jesus and the end of time coming, uh, the apocalyptic end of everything, leaves people with a lot of anxiety. The other way of looking at it, the, the ah, you know, it's been 2,000 years. It's been 2,000 years. If Jesus, is, if Jesus hasn't come, Jesus isn't coming. <laughs> you know, that kind of view, it can kind of produce a sense of apathy. And those who, who are uh, ambivalent, they run the risk of falling into this state of apathy, and those who are focused on the second coming run into this risk of faith being something that's just filled with fear and anxiety. And our text today, in the context of Advent, really attempts to replace apathy with faith and fear and anxiety with hope. Now, I have to admit, I'll, I'll confess to you this, I tend to be in the ambivalent camp of the second coming. Uh, you know, I'm extremely skeptical of people like Hal Lindsey and LaHaye, and I don't think the second coming is at the heart of what the gospel is about. And again, like others have said, it's been 2,000 years, and plenty of good spots where Jesus could have come in, right, and done something. <laughs> like, there were, we're not lacking in moments when it would be great if Jesus popped in there, right? Uh, and, you know, throughout, throughout history, and, and yet that hasn't come. And I, I do 
agree. I think when you are under the thumb of oppression, of course you look for justice, you look for God's judgment, you look for a dramatic intervention, and that's, that's important to your survival, that's important to keeping your faith and keeping your hope alive. And so in that, re in that regard, understanding the New Testament as a, a document, uh, several documents that anticipate God's intervention, dramatic intervention, becomes an important part of living through difficult times. Amen? However, I, and, and, and because of that, I hang on to this, what, what we call in the biz, eschatological theology, because it, you know, it's, it's all over the New Testament, first of all. I'd have to throw out a lot if I were choosing to ignore it. But more importantly, it, it speaks to a God who is a God of history. And it speaks to a God who brings things to a culmination. In other words, God's hand has been heavily um, interested and involved in the lives of humanity from creation on forward. And God has a vested interest in bringing things to some kind of culmination and conclusion. Uh, at the heart of it, the apocalyptic eschaton, more, more Bible scholar language, the, the eschaton, the end times, with its final parousia, appearing of Christ as king, is the culmination of all hopes and dreams of all humanity. It paints a picture of a God who wins in the end against the powers and principalities at work against God, against the kingdom of God. It's the advent of that kingdom of God that Jesus described for us, but never fully realized on a large scale. And that same kingdom that we live out in small, writ large. It is the hopeful view of the calamities that plague us now, but that ultimately bend to the will of God and collapse under the weight of God's hope for this world. And so for that reason, I, I hang on to this language of Jesus coming again. The, we worship the Jesus who was, who is, and is to come. And we live in the tension of all three of those things. And I'm not, even in my skepticism, uh, and even understanding the writings of the New Testament grounded in its own time, I still will not let go of that language because it draws us to hope. And it, it speaks of a God who continues to be invested in creation. So I keep the end times talk and the language of Jesus' return because it represents ultimate hope in the sovereignty of God. Now for those who anxiously await this coming by scouring the Bible for clues and then look at the newspapers for confirmation that indeed the world is on the brink of destruction, our text today says very plainly that that's just wrong-minded. We have no idea what tomorrow will bring. Jesus even says it here in Matthew that he doesn't know what tomorrow will bring. No one knows. The angels don't know. You don't know. I don't know. Uh, Harold Camping didn't know. Uh, La you know, uh, 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 LaHaye doesn't know. Hal Lindsey doesn't know. And if someone comes up to you and says they know, they don't. <laughs> they don't know what tomorrow will bring. We're all living today and have no idea what tomorrow may look like or what may happen. Uh, so obsessing about when the end will come is futile and a distraction from what God really wants us to focus on. Uh, I just mentioned Harold Camping. I should explain. Harold Camping was the guy, I remember a few years ago, was predicting that on March 22nd, some year, the world was going to end and he had the billboards up all over the place. And he did that for two years in a row. He predicted the end was going to come for two years in a row. And when it didn't happen the second time, he stood up and said, you know what, I don't, I don't think, I, I've never heard anyone do this. He stood up and said, I must be wrong. Clearly, I'm wrong. 
And then he disappeared from public life and died a few years later and uh, feeling like a complete failure because he banked everything on the end of the world coming when he predicted it. And he, he was wrong. And he died feeling that way. Anyway, so it's not long. And so people live in this and it's, it's futile. We don't know. We can't know. It's not long after this text when Jesus tells us in the parable of the sheep and the goats that whatever we do unto the least of these, we do unto him. And when Jesus says, be ready, be awake, be prepared for whatever may come, this is what Jesus has in mind. We need to be about the work and we need to be about the focus of what Jesus has called us to do and the things that God wants us to do. I hear all of this a kind of treat every day as your last kind of a thing, right? Uh, make each day count for something. Make each day uh, better than the last. Make each day a day when you make a difference, when your life stands for something. Matthew urges us to keep awake in this way. And, and again, Jesus goes on to describe what that staying awake looks like feeding the hungry, taking care of the poor, visiting the sick, doing those things that herald in the kingdom of God that we're praying for and hoping for and longing for in the eschaton, in the end times of all, the culmination of all things. And so as we enter this Advent season, we each are invited <coughs> to, to anticipate the impact of God on the world both when Jesus came into it in the Christmas story but also as Jesus continues to come into it in the everyday lives we live in the way we get up every day and say today I'm gonna live it like it's the last one and the last chance I have to be faithful to all that God has called me to and to expect that in the future, God is going to be there working too, just like God is working in the here and now. Invite us to live in the tension of all of that. Jesus in the past, Jesus in the now, and Jesus in the future. Let us pray. Oh, loving and gracious God, thank you so much that you are a God who continues and is constant throughout history. Uh, I thank you that you are a God who it urges us not to give in to despair, but to release that despair to hope and to not give in to, uh, anxiety, uh, to apathy, but to turn that apathy to active faith that anticipates your good work coming to a culmination in the kingdom of God. May we do our part to live it out in our every day. We ask all of this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our friend. Amen.